Good afternoon, bonjour, madame et monsieur. Welcome to Through the Clapboard Jungle, Justin McConnell in conversation with Vincenzo Natale, a talk between two generations of independent Canadian genre filmmakers. Justin McConnell is a Canadian director, writer, and cinematographer based in Toronto. Uh, his most recent film, Clapboard Jungle, fantastic documentary, is kind of a, an independent filmmaker survival guide, is playing our lineup this year. Very much worth looking at. It's here on demand. Uh, I think you have till tomorrow night to rent it, so do it. Uh, we world premiered his 2018 film, Life Changer, which was just a fantastic, fantastic movie. Uh, and previous works include The Broken Mile, The Collapsed, Skull World. Vincenzo Natale is a Canadian genre film luminary who first burst on the scene in 1997 with Cube, and has since made such works as Cypher, Splice, he's directed episodes of Blue Cage, Westworld, Orphan Black, Hannibal, American Gods, and The Strain, and most recently directed the Netflix feature In the Tall Grass, based on the Stephen King novella. Um, without further ado, it is a pleasure to introduce to you Justin McConnell and Vincenzo Natale. Hello, how is everybody? Hello. Ah, welcome to the brave new world. <laughs> oh man, that's <laughs> true. I thought, you know, when I saw, first of all, I love Clapboard Jungle. Um, and I thought your timing was superb because <laughs> it comes, it arrives at a moment when everything is changing, when it feels like in the film world, as well as in life in general, we're kind of walking a knife's edge. Mm -hmm. And and I feel like watching your movie, I was walking a knife's edge with you because that's such a difficult, tough terrain to negotiate, you know, as an independent filmmaker. So um, how are you feeling right now that we're kind of slipping over one side over of the, the edge? <laughs> into, into the unknown, <laughs> into the into unknown the waters of the future, whatever that means. Uh, honestly, it's weird. It, it, the movie took so long to make that uh, the things in the business changed from 2014 to 2020, the same as they would have changed from 2009 to 2014. So by the time I got into post-production, there was a lot of stuff people said in interviews that wasn't even really applicable anymore to some degree. Um, so it was just kind of difficult uh, to even fought, make a movie that seemed timely, but also timeless at the same time, because it's, it's very much like a it's meant to not just be a movie about filmmaking. It's about, sort of about the soul of the artist. It's, it's a little bit about, um, you know, self-doubt and uh, imposter syndrome and just like, how do you cope mentally with constantly second guessing yourself and then the, a business that throws that in your face and all that. And then I get it done and it's finished post and it's ready to get out into the world and the world just falls apart. So there's no real possibility of uh, production going forward. We were, we were supposed to be shooting a movie in Australia, Mark of Cain, uh, in May this year. Uh, that was the goal. We had our finance together. We were casting for our leads and it's like, oh, we're never going to be able to leave our country for like a good year and a half. <laughs> we might lose the book rights. Who knows what's going on? But, but there's just, that's just what the business seems to be is constant hurdles, just nonstop. Just, and I'm sure somebody like you, who's a little further along, you've still got the hurdles, but they're just different and in, in different kind of ways. Um, yeah, I would say I wasn't trying to tap into any kind of zeitgeist or any kind of moment. I was just trying to be honest to the situation I was in and the business was in and keeping my ear to the ground. And this is sort of just what came out of it ultimately. And, but as a, a younger filmmaker, how do you feel about this moment? Um, well, I look at it as sort of a, a, a double-edged sword in some ways. I actually like being in this moment because I realize that if I'm pragmatic enough and I'm realistic about what, my chances are and all of that sort of thing. Um, I have a lot of new avenues to uh, my goals available to me that somebody 20 years ago may not have, um, or even earlier than that. You know, you say, oh, it was easier to get a movie made back in the day. I don't think that's entirely like true uh, that you could have just like gone and knocked on the door of the industry and gone, okay, I'm in kind of thing. Um, but you can kind of make your own path now. So I'm in a position where I'm, I'm sitting here and yeah, I don't know what's going to happen past this. I don't know what theatrical vocal is going to look like in a year. I don't know how viable mid-range budgets are going to be going forward. I don't know any of that stuff. But at least I can go, okay, I think I can carve my own path pretty directly on a very grassroots kind of way for as long as I need to be, until the conditions are better, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, in this moment, it's just, it's just a weird time. 
I mean, to, to present, to present a, a, a new movie you made to the world in a virtual way and sit on your couch in your boxers with a scotch in your hand when it premieres and go, well, I hope everybody who watched it liked it, but not knowing and seeing their faces and being in an audience with them, uh, you know, to get accolades and all these great reviews. But, you know, I haven't really left my apartment much in six weeks, six months. It's, it's just, it, it's like you're in this little bubble and the outside world is happening, but everybody's experiencing it in these little bubbles. And it's just surreal. Um, I don't... I don't know. I honestly don't know how to how to quantify the moment I'm in right now, except to say it's a little surreal. To I mean, to put it mildly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like when I I think one of the takeaways for me watching your movie, which was really in a way profound, was that as opposed to ending on a note of well, I got to this point and mm -hmm. I I arrived which is basically your story, right? Because you, you know, you made Life Changers as a terrific film, it's very well received. Um, and you, you kind of achieved your dream. You, you actually say, well, I'm, I'm still climbing a ladder. Yeah. And it's, and it's, and I'm paraphrasing, but something to the effect of, you know, it's the climb that is important mm -hmm. and I'll never stop climbing. So I think that philosophy must serve you very well in a moment like this. It's, it's hearts of darkness, right? It's the journey, not the destination. It's, it, it's, it's all about remembering every moment of the path that you took and uh, the work that you put in and enjoying the actual struggle. I mean, I, I don't say enjoying struggle and mean like, oh, I enjoy all the down moments that all of us have to varying degrees. But, but I do mean that you got to look back and go all these little bits of foundation you put on yourself, everything that you do to get yourself to where you need to be is just another step on a path to wherever you're going to ultimately be. And I don't think anybody can qualify their career until they're able to look back on it 30 years later anyway. And in talking to so many legendary filmmakers, they, you know, a guy like Brian Usna, for example, uh, he bluntly was like, I had no idea any of my films had any impact until 20 years later when they started showing up mm -hmm. on special edition Blu-rays and fan conventions that were happening and things like that. And it's like, I, I really empathize with that and get that. And I, I would rather, um, I would rather just keep working and just keep trying to do the next thing better and the next thing better for myself, not necessarily for the rest of the world, just so that I'm always happier. So that the, the thing inside my head that ends up on the screen is closer to the thing inside my head more and more as I go on kind of thing. Um, I would rather that and reflect on that and take pleasure and uh, comfort in that than worry about getting to like a, a particular lofty goal, like climbing the top of a film, film's Mount Everest or whatever. Um, and to go, oh, I'm on top of the world, you know, that <laughs> the James Cameron moment. I, mm -hmm. I just, that moment is has, is not, at this point in my life, particularly important to me. I, I, I think what's most important is just, is just to keep creating and to keep being able to tell stories and get more resources to be able to tell the stories better in the future. That's really all that, that it matters it is that, is the climb is just to keep going, keep swimming. And, and then in this particular moment when your film is sort of on ice, while this is happening, what are you mm -hmm. doing? Oh, um, well, I, I'm writing a new script to add to my ever-ending drawer of scripts. Uh, <laughs> I uh, shot an isolation short film in July that's starting to do some festivals where I tasked myself to literally, I shot it in this apartment alone and I tasked myself to do everything, act in it, shoot it, um, <laughs> with, whatever, with whatever resources I possibly could, score it, everything, just for the fun of it. It's starting to do festivals. Uh, I, <laughs> Is that, wait, that's a short film? That's a short film, yeah. It's called oh, Soul great. Contact. Uh, it, it'll be online eventually, but uh, yeah, it's it's super weird, and I don't want to give it away because I think some people who I grew up with or who I know may watch and go, I, I ne I'm never going to get that image out of my head because <laughs> they know me well. <laughs> like I, I put myself out there in an embarrassing way potentially, so we'll find out. Um, and uh, I've picked up playing music again. I've, I've slowly written an entire album over the summer. <laughs> <laughs> like synthwave, uh, industrial metal tinged weirdness because I don't know what else I'm supposed to do right now. There's not, there's not much production happening and the stuff that is happening is, is usually larger stuff and um, television and things like that that are starting to come back. However, on a moral level, I have trouble with the idea of endangering the crew in any way. And I don't mean that like you can't shoot safely, but I think a lot of the shoot safely stuff right now is a bit like safety theater. Um, you can put all the masks on you want and put all the hand sanitizer stations up you, that you want to and do all the testing that you want. 
it's only a matter of time before someone gets sick. And I just, I don't want to be that crew that gets someone sick and dies. Like literally um, the, the Paper Tigers that's playing Fantasia just had a crew member who was on a commercial shoot after they shot that film and passed away from COVID. And it's, it's very tragic, but it's like, oh my God. they caught it on a set and they're dead. And I, and I don't, I'm not going to be able to morally produce anything until I know it's safe to do so. So I have to make, make myself busy developing and getting things moving forward so that when it's time to make those steps to, to make those steps then when it's the right time. And I feel that's how I feel about it. I know there's lots of people producing and nothing wrong if you've decided that's what you're going to do, but that's kind of where I'm at. So I, um, oh, and we're in post-production. We're in post-production on the eight episode educational companion series for Clapboard Jungle. Oh, right. so that, that's oh, like, that's, great. that's a pretty, Kevin's- Jesus Christ, pretty, you're busy. Yeah. That's, you better take a break. Oh, and I have client work too. I, I, I run a post-production company. So I do like Blu-ray and DVD authoring and trailer editing and all kinds of stuff for clients. So it's just, uh, I'm not bored. I'm definitely not bored. You know, and when I am bored, I just play video games or something it's, or watch movies. So whatever. <laughs> that sounds great. I, it's been interesting for me because I, in an odd way, I've kind of liked this time. A little bit. Because... Yeah, kind of it, because it created, it stopped everything. And I don't think any other event could have stopped the world the way this has. Yeah. And then it, in turn, I, I mean, obviously there's a tremendous amount of suffering going on. So that's it's, not something anyone wants to see happen, but it is good to see the world take pause and reevaluate. And I think, you know, individually, it's giving people an opportunity to reevaluate. I would liken it to I've just run a, a relay race or a marathon for the past decade and now I've had a moment to sit down and take stock and um, figure out what's really important to me and uh, and reevaluate sort of I, I mean it, it's it's a it's a locked in period mentally to some degree where you go okay well if this is on pause what else can I do to fill my time and in doing that you kind of find yourself further um, especially in the face of a crisis where you know you I mean I'll be honest when this first started like early January, I was right on top of it. I, I saw it coming and I started warning my family and friends. And I thought, I thought it was going to be even worse than it is now because I was looking at civilian video coming out of, uh, out of Wuhan and through WeChat and stuff like that. People being torn out of their homes and, you know, doors being welded shut on buildings and stuff. And, and I, I was like early February, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to draft, draft a will email just in case. I'm going to like, I, I, I took it pretty serious. I did, I did, it's, it's in my, I'm just completely serious. I know it sounds insane. But I did it in a way where I, it, it was it was almost an extra step of taking stock because I, I was able to gather together in one email everything important to me at the moment of the work I was doing and put it in one place so that if I was on my way to the hospital or I'm about to be put on a ventilator, all I got to do is go into my uh, drafts folder and hit send and it goes out to the right people and I know whatever work I've been doing, you know, unless they don't give a shit, will continue onward. So I did all that and that was like moments of a moment of taking stock and of like just putting everything into one box and then from there it allowed me to kind of spread my wings a bit and go even though i'm here i i i feel like i've grown um mentally a bit and in, and my outlook is a little bit changed um hmm. for better or for worse <laughs> well it remains to be seen <laughs> and and in terms of uh how you might move forward with the next film. Do you think this experience is going to change how you make movies? Well, I think it's going to change how all of us make movies for a while. Um, at least while the safety protocols and things are very much in, at the forefront. Um, I, I, I don't know about that though, because I don't know the level of the next movie I'm going to make. So there's a very big difference between a, something pretty down to earth and low budget like Life Changer that we did you know, a few years ago um, which was relatively low budget, like very low budget, but still had a decent crew and had like the stuff we needed to pull off most of what was actually in the script to a relatively effective way. Um, and something like, you, I'm sure what you've, your experience is shooting like Westworld or, or um, any of the larger TV series that you've worked on or in the tall grass even where you have more resources to work with. Um, so I think depending on the level of the film and how big it is, uh, I think my, just naturally my, the way I make a film has to change. Um, I, cause there's a big difference between the little tiny, uh, do it yourself, you know, five to 20 person crew who are like a family and the hundred something plus crew that mm -hmm. and multiple technical departments and, you know, studio people to answer to. And, 
you know, I, I, I sort of work in a microcosm of that with my career the size it is right now. And the bigger you get, you, you can speak to this, Vincenzo, and you probably should. Like, what is the difference between when you were doing something like Nothing, you know, which I love, I love that film, and the larger, I, the larger stuff that you've done sort of down the path? Uh, you know, it's always, for me, I've never done anything that large, really. I mean, the biggest film I made was Splice. That was about a $26 million budget. Well, that's... But it was still, it was still independent. Mm -hmm. I think the difference is there's studio and there's independent, mm -hmm. regardless of what the budget is. And, and I've, in some respects, have been lucky not to make a studio. I've been, I've been lucky enough to be unsuccessful enough that I haven't made a studio movie per se. Um, except I guess you could call The Tall Grass a studio film because it's a Netflix, Netflix movie, but the way yeah. effectively they function like a studio in the good sense in that they completely financed us and protected us when the film was finished. Mm -hmm. um, but they didn't function like a studio in the bad sense in that there were no test screenings. There was, you know, they gave us feedback, but it was never prescriptive. It was only suggestive. So I've been, I've sort of been spared that bad studio experience. And, and I've just found oddly enough that the way I make films hasn't changed much since I was making super eight films as a kid. I mean, there are more people for sure. And the tools obviously change, but like the fundamental issues remain the same regardless. And um, where it's a little different is, you know, the TV work I've done because I'm walking into someone else's house <laughs> and, and I'm always aware and, you know, cognizant of the fact that I'm working for them and this is not my thing. I try to invest as much of myself into it as I can. Like I try to make every TV episode as if it's my movie, but I do it knowing that at the end of the day, it's actually not my movie right. and that I'm giving, I'm giving the baby up at the end. Um, uh, and, and there's actually something wonderful about that too, a kind of freedom from the tyranny of myself. You don't bring it home you know, with you, right? to some degree. Don't, not as much. And then I just, um, I, this is not something I expected when I, when I started doing TV, I did it completely in a mercenary way. I just needed to make a living because doing what you're doing <laughs> <laughs> was just too, I, I couldn't, I had a family to support. It was just uh, untenable, um, especially uh, when I made that transition kind of in the, uh, around 2000 and I don't know what it was, 12 or so on, like it, the independent film industry was really shrinking. And, and I used to survive almost purely on uh, development and there wasn't oh, really yeah. any money in development. I don't have money ever. <laughs> no, so, uh, so I, I, I started, I just put the word out, uh, I'd like to do some television. It ended up being kind of rejuvenating for me creatively. That was what I didn't expect because um, it was such a slow process getting movies made, mm -hmm. such a, a, a arduous journey being in development. And I had a, two kind of painful experiences in a row. Um, and I was really fatigued at the end of it. And, and the wonderful thing about TV is you just sort of fall into someone else's world. And, and all of a sudden, I was kind of looking at the material um, in a way that I wouldn't look at my own material with a more objective perspective. And, um, and I found it really energizing. Um, so it was, it's been, it, and I was lucky to work on things that I liked. Like I was, I've been grateful. I've never had to work on a TV show that I wouldn't watch myself. Well, have like, you that I wouldn't enjoy those shows though, and then turn them down. Like what, what sort of, it was that a decision actively you made or was it uh, just, you've never been offered something you didn't like? Uh, oh, I've been offered things I didn't like, but I've never accepted anything I didn't okay. like. All right. Yeah. So and, uh, and I feel, yeah. I feel really lucky that way. You know, the thing is, when you make a movie, mm -hmm. it's your movie. You own it and you wear it forever. When you do a TV show, you don't. And and it's kind of. I think it's probably a little bit like the way the old studio directors did in Hollywood's heyday, like where they would make multiple films a year, and no one really even thought about the director as owning the movie. It was only after, you know, the sixties and the auteur theory and so yeah, on yeah. Um, that, that your movies in some ways became a little bit of a ball and chain because you didn't have the flexibility to just play, you know, you, whatever you made, you were going to live with it for better or worse for the rest of your life. And the nice thing about TV is you can be, it's a little bit like life changer. Mm. You just <laughs> like shift you into step a... into someone else's, you shift into someone else's yeah. body for a while 
And, and I think artistically, that's actually healthy. I think it's a good thing to do that as long as you don't like life, life change or lose yourself in the process. So, um, uh, and a few of the things I worked on, like Hannibal, for instance, was a show that I felt I actually did some of my best work on as, as a director. And that was large, largely to do with you know, the people that I was working with. So um, anyway, all of this is to say, I think that making movies, regardless of budget, tend in, in, the, in the circumstances where you don't have somebody breathing down your neck mm -hmm. and, and potentially taking away your creative control, um, it's always the same. It just is. And it always feels, and it feels to me like, in my experience, it's always been the ratio of money I've had to what I'm trying to put on the screen always ends up being proportional. Like I never seem to get to the place where I have, oh, I've got more resources than I need. It's always like, I, I always have this. The same you always find a place resources. for that money. <laughs> that's right. Uh, so that that's my, and of course, everyone's had different experiences. And I have friends who've had horrendous experiences where the movies are taken away and so on, but that's been mine. What I loved about your film, Clapboard Jungle, is that I think more than any other movie I've seen, it is a first person's perspective into that, the mental process. Like I think people talk about the making of movies a lot, like the technique and the hardware and you know personalities and all that, but rarely do you get a perspective that shows someone's mental journey, an emotional journey. And yeah. you, 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 in a very naked and brave and honest way. Wait, I cut out all the nudity. You did that. No. <laughs> <laughs> did you? I oh, no, you're right. I left That's a, my, only, my only criticism, there should have been a little more, <laughs> just in. Just not enough wang. <laughs> <laughs> that would have really put it over the edge. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but I think, you know, you really captured that process beautifully and, I, and, and showed truly why it's so difficult. I think, you know, when you go to film school, people are talking about making movies, but the truth is most of your time is not making movies. That's the hard part. Making mm -hmm. the movie is tough, but that's nothing compared to the not making movie part, which yeah. is what you've chronicled so beautifully and so bravely. And, and the way, I mean, your particular path and everyone has a different path was, is so hard. Watching you like going to all those various markets yourself Mm -hmm. being a producer for yourself I never had to sell myself that way like I've never I've always I've been very I think pampered that way like I've had producers to help me do that kind of legwork and watching you do it was so empowering in a way inspiring like I think you really it was amazing and it was amazing how you captured it um but but also um sorry I'm going on but I but also uh inspiring because I feel like we all walk that same path to a greater or lesser extent. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you're right. It never changes. It just, it just takes on a different vessel. Yeah. And I'd be lying though, if I said I did it entirely alone, right? Like uh, having Avi Fettergreen in my corner helped a lot getting life changer mm -hmm. made, you know, a lot of his calls were part of the reason we were able to get that money together uh, on this documentary, Daryl Shaw and Kevin, like I, and just I, Serena Whitney, who co-write wrote Kane with me and worked on do you see what mm -hmm. I see and stuff. All these people that I've sort of gradually surrounded myself with over the last decade. Um, I couldn't do it without them. So while it feels like I was, you know, I was going to a lot of these markets alone and, and these festivals alone on my own sort of journey, they were there through parts of the journey enough that um, I realized that I wouldn't be where I am today without them. So I do think that like, although I didn't have a manager or an agent or a rep kind of like shopping stuff for me, or I didn't have a producer going, hey, have you heard of this guy, Justin? He's got great stuff. Um, and it's taking all the meetings for me. It was always me in the room for the most part. Um, I, I would be shortchanging the journey if I didn't also mention that, you know, I did put a team around myself, you know, who had a degree of cachet in various lo different levels that um, helped me get where I'm going. Because I, I, I don't think film is, and it's said in the movie too, you know, it takes a village to some degree, right? You're working with Copperheart all the time, or a lot of the time now, you know, you've mm -hmm. got I, Mark, right? Um, is, his, is his name Mark? Mark and Steve. Yeah, yeah Mark, Mark and Steve. Smith and Steve yeah. Hoven. Yeah. yeah, you've got them that you work to, with, together with. There's always this core sort of, even if it's just people you bounce ideas off of, and who, like Daryl, 
who we'll bring on a little later, is the one person in my life, I, and I, it's really getting to me during writing this album, because I sent him, he's working on my cover art, and I'm sending him like tracks, and I'll send him one track, and I'll get like a fucking novel worth of notes on a three minute song, and it's like, you know, I've gone past the point where I find stuff like that a little um, irritating, and I'm now like, thank you for being there, man, and thank you for being so fucking honest, because like, I, your friends have a tendency to say the nice things to you, to your face, and the less nice things to you about you behind your back, even though they're your, your friends. And the friends who can say the shitty things to you, to your face, are very valuable in the film industry and in any artistic pursuit, because as much as you'll second guess yourself, it, getting that second negative kind of, oh, okay, yeah, no, maybe I, that can be improved if I did this, gives you that extra kick in the ass you need to get going. And Daryl, I brought on at the very beginning of the Clapboard Jungle shooting process to check me because I knew I was making a movie about myself. And that could easily turn into a vanity project or self-serving. And mm. um, luckily, mm. the majority of the people who've seen this now uh, aren't don't see it as a self-serving film, but there have been a couple people who have found it, like, uh, you know, just, I, I think in... I can't really judge it because I made it, but I truly tried not to make a vanity project. And there's been like three or four people total out of oh, hundreds now who've said, oh, this is just a vanity project and it's whiny and things like that. And I, it's not what I set out to make. And, um, and I really tried really hard not to. And, uh, and part of that was just making sure I had a team of people around me who could call me on my bullshit. And I'm, uh, I, and you need that in life. Even if you're not an artist, you need people to sit you aside, even if they're wrong, to point out whatever flaw you might need to evaluate in yourself so you can improve as a person, let alone an artist. And I'm, maybe that's, maybe I'm going off on a tangent there, but that, um, no, I no. really feel that about life. I really feel like you can really get full of yourself if you don't have anyone checking you. <laughs> Is that, no, I think, no, I think that's, an, obviously that's kind of what it's all about. Mm -hmm. If you wanted, if you wanted to do this all alone, you'd be writing a book or you'd be yeah, exactly. recording that that out, you never stop recording albums, but it's, it's a communal experience. And no, I think that came through in the film. It really did. And I, and I don't think there's anything self-aggrandizing about it. I don't think it, I didn't see it as a vanity project and at least I saw it as actually a very humbling and brutally honest self-portrait of somebody who's, you know, a little insane. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> As we all have to be to do this. Yeah. Um, and, and completely dedicated to this thing. That is, I mean, what I, what I, in my old age, what, what I think is so important about this process is that it is, uh, I think, by, and by necessity, uh, a process that forces you to become a better person. And maybe it's because of that community that is required to make a movie successful. Like you have to communicate, you have to be, I think anyway, you have to be a decent human being to get the best results out of the people that you work with. And maybe just as importantly or more importantly to like enjoy it, you know, to like enjoy, because it, at, you know, eventually we're all gonna be dead <laughs> and none of this will be ma will matter. And eventually all our films will be forgotten. Well, I like, yeah, I love that. I love the idea that everything we make right now is just a trivia answer down the road. A, a friend of mine, Der uh, At best, Chris, we should a, be so yeah, lucky. Yeah, a friend of mine, Chris Nash, said that to me during the production of this. He, I interviewed him, but he's not in the feature, but he'll be in the series. And I, that's been stuck in my head ever since he said it, where I'm like, yeah, I'm making trivia. I'm making trivia answers right now. That's at best <laughs> what I'm doing. So I have to be happy about it for myself. And then other people are gravy, basically, I think, because it's on my tombstone when I'm dead. It's on nobody else's tombstone. The work that I've made that's come from my brain, you know, the mistakes that I make stick with me more than anybody else. You know, they're, they'll forget and move on to the next film they hate. But I, I'm always going to be going, you're right, I did make a big mistake there. God damn it. <laughs> well, and that's a very interesting point, especially in light of this moment. And I'd be curious to hear what you, you think about it. But uh, we're definitely living in a time where when there's a surplus of movies and there's a surplus of TV and there's a mm -hmm. surplus of this word that I truly, truly despise, but content. I'll use it right now. Yeah, content. And, uh, and so it becomes disposable. Mm -hmm. And the way that, frankly, the way music has become disposable. Well, it seems like music is a little ahead of the curve of where movies are, maybe because it's a you know a less expensive medium um, and less technically uh, demanding to produce and distribute. But 
in the way that music and musicians have kind of found themselves in a place of not being promoted yeah. and not being seen and not, you know, making brilliant work. Like there's beautiful stuff happening right now that any, in any previous era probably would have garnered a lot of attention, but kind of just comes and goes. Mm -hmm. And on one hand, I find that sad. On the other hand, there's something oddly liberating about it because yeah. for the same reason we were talking earlier, like about um, not becoming, you know, uh, so attached to the work that you do that it becomes a burden. Like it, I think there's something nice about just making something and then moving on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, because ultimately the world's going to judge it how the world's going to judge it. And uh, if you are so connected to something that you make to such a degree that it becomes your entire identity and you pour your everything into it while you're making it, that's okay. Because you need the focus to be able to make something good anyway. It needs to sort of consume you while you're making it. But after that moment, uh, I mean, the reality of it is, is we have an infinitesimal time on this planet. And if you live off of one accomplishment for if, if that's what's giving you air for years and years and years and years and years, you're going to miss out on so much other life to live. And it, it, you know, once you look back and I, I even I, I'm 39 in a month, I'm not, I'm not that old, but I still have old man brain to some degree where I look back at like a decade of my life in my twenties and go, okay, I feel like I really lived in my twenties. Um, but there were moments where, you know, six or eight months of depression would lead me down a spiral of just like playing Final Fantasy and smoking weed, you know, where I, I go, I probably needed that for myself to, you know, to get past whatever was going up on up here. But there could have been so much else I could have been doing if I wasn't focused on, oh, whatever was was dwelling in that brain of mine that, that mm -hmm. held me back from just moving on and doing something that fulfilled me to some degree. And I think age has given me that wisdom of going, just let it go and just move on to the next thing. Because even if you fail at something, that's one failure in a path that isn't all going to be failures. So do the next thing and make it better or uh, whatever the project happens to be. Um, and it is absolutely freeing to know, to some degree, it's freeing to know that you've made one of 10,000 movies made this year. And you're going to have a tiny share of that audience, depending on the platform you're on. Um, but you aren't going to be the only thing in the conversation for a long time. So the conversations become bigger too. Uh, it's a little freeing to know that because although it has less value now, these films, they, they just don't have the value they used to. And some of them, some of the streaming stuff, their shelf life of being in the public consciousness is like four days or less, right? Like, like, you know, a, a major Netflix pr film premieres on a Friday and by Tuesday, they're talking about something else. Like the, the, mm -hmm. the general, conversation online um that is a little freeing but it's also a little depressing because again you're just making these little trivia answers and now you realize that 20 years down the line when people are talking this trivia because there was so much stuff it's not like when you do horror trivia now for example and you're talking about horror movies from the 80s and you're actually competing against people because they all watched the same movies growing up and they all went and rented the same VHSs and, you know, went to the same theaters and, you know, people saw all the Friday the 13th sequels. Not everybody saw, you know, there is no, there's no general consensus anymore. You know, stuff like Midsommar and Hereditary and all these bigger horror films, they're going to get remembered. But the indie stuff, the really indie stuff is going to, some of them will go cult and some of them are just going to get forgotten, especially in the era of streaming where using your band analogy, how many bands died when MySpace went down, do you think? Like mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. was however many hundreds of thousands of projects on MySpace who had built up these right. followings of people, right? Then their profile gets taken down because MySpace dies and what happens? Well, are they gonna rebuild that fan base somewhere else? A lot of them aren't, they're just gonna stop because they're gonna get so frustrated by it. If your work only lives on platforms and those platforms have a shelf life, you know, it's almost like you're making fast food to some degree. So you might as well make it the best fast food you can move on and make the next thing. <laughs> it's very interesting. It's a different, it's yeah. a different way of thinking. Like I, I wondered, I made this movie for Netflix, um, which is entirely my movie. Like I wrote it, you know, I, I came to them with it. They didn't come to me. Um, and they, but, and it was wonderful. I had a really great experience. Ex but my, my one concern is they own everything. Mm -hmm. And what, I have no idea what their position is on preservation, 
if they have one, but what happens if Netflix goes down? Yeah. Like where exactly. does the, I don't know where those materials are. There's like, no what, physical I don't, copies either, right? And there's no, there's no physical copy. But you know what's going to make um, it live on. It's actually the first film Piracy. I made that didn't have a physical copy. Piracy is the reason your film's going to live on if Netflix goes down. They're, that's, those are the copies that are going to live on. That's yeah, maybe. Part. Yeah. That's very interesting. Mm, yeah. That's very interesting. Part. Because it's a Stephen King property, for one thing, which means people are going to always want to watch it in their Stephen King marathons. But beyond that, if, if it's gone, if Netflix is gone and they haven't put any physical and they haven't figured out any way to back it up, it's still going to exist on message boards somewhere, which is sad because that's not money in your pocket, but it's cool in that somebody's going to preserve it in the cloud of the internet somewhere. It's going to exist. We can, we can only hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unless, of course, the electro electricity stops existing and the internet stops existing, and then who, who the fuck knows? <laughs> yeah, actually, a lot of things may stop existing oh, after yeah. November. We'll see what happens. Well, it's not um, even just that. The next 50 years, we've got climate change to face, so who knows what new stuff is down the pipeline. But let's not be too negative. <laughs> or it could be quite the opposite. It could be. It could be a, wonder yeah. it could be a wonderful moment. Yeah. Uh, do you... I think you're in an interesting point in your career because you've you made a really terrific feature film with Life Changer. Like I think it's a really, I think it's a very a highly provocative, well-conceived and executed film that 100% cements you as a filmmaker to watch, especially in the genre space. Um, uh, and, and now you've made this documentary, which is kind of a, a sort of unexpected, but charming left turn that um, even if it isn't self-aggrandizing, I think kind of gives you a profile. I'm sure that wasn't your intention, but it Not does. Like, I, th but yeah. I think it's a good thing. Um, do you, <sighs> do you think at all about your trajectory as a filmmaker? Like, does that enter your who, daily who doesn't? thought process? Like, I'm sure every filmmaker has to be thinking about that. Like, that's, <laughs> Yeah, of course. Um, and, and it's even things like, uh, I'll give a good example. When Life Changer played Fantasia, I had three different management companies reach out. I signed with none of them. Two of them, just, I just felt like, okay, but I've been, I know all the same people you do. So why am I going to sign with a manager and give money away to, to get in the rooms that I'm already getting in? That was part of it. Then the third company just sort of like passed on me once they saw Life Changer and that's fine. And now with Clapboard Jungle, I've had some very big management companies reach out and uh, I'm, I'm talking to them and that's great and that's all fine. Um, and I have no idea if I'm going to sign with anybody. I've never had a manager or an agent. I've always kind of done it myself. But that sort of thought process is going through my head. Like, well, if I give up a bit of this control and start dealing with a bigger company in LA to start positioning me for projects, what direction does my career take? Do I start directing TV? Do I maybe get one of my own projects off the ground or am I going to be just kept, kept sending reboots and, you know, what the next hot horror property from Bloomhouse or what? I, I'm not saying any of this stuff. Is oh, you happen. will. Yeah, I probably will. No, you will. Yeah, yeah. Like, that, like <laughs> I'll if tell I, you, I, I'll tell you. I 100% will tell you what will happen. Okay, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. um, I don't know where it, it'll lead you ultimately, but what will happen, because it happens to everybody, mm -hmm. is that you'll be feted, you'll meet with many, many people, mm -hmm. a lot of really impressive people, maybe some people you admire or companies that you admire. It, it'll be really, really fun. And you'll. it will seem like it, it's at, at first blush that the world is your oyster and that many, many projects are being offered to you. You will then be horribly disappointed <laughs> because it, to, to, to quote Dorothy Parker, Hollywood kills with encouragement. So um, that isn't to say you shouldn't do these things. Right. And that isn't to say that something great won't happen because of it. But I think as a, as a cautionary tale, and I, I say this because I went through it and I've seen other younger filmmaker friends of mine go through it. The, the, the seductive nature of Hollywood is is pretty much irresistible, especially for somebody like you or me who, you know, probably grew up on a steady diet of that stuff and have yeah. real affection for the, you know, the movies that they make um, and made. And, uh, but it is, and you should follow that path if that's something you want to do, like you really should, but, and this is the big but, it, you have to, I would advise any young filmmaker to keep one foot outside of it. Keep one foot in 
Toronto or wherever you're originally based, or even if you live in LA, like one foot outside of that mainstream and in a place where you know you can still make your own work. Yeah. Because there's a reasonable chance you're going to have to go back there anyway. And um, that's why I think, like, I would never worry about you because you can generate your own stuff. You've done it time and time again, and, and you'll just continue to do it. Um, but, but that is... The, 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 the true evil of Hollywood um, isn't that it, it destroys your dreams, it's that it fuels them. And, and it wastes your, in the process, it wastes your time. Yeah, I could, I could see that being the case. And look, a big part of me loves the Maverick filmmakers, the Frank Hennon Lauders, the George Romero's, the, you know, the people that worked completely outside the system from the majority of their careers. I, I love the fact that they have a legacy that they own 100% their own to some degree, like that they, that what, was, what was in their head and what they wanted to do is basically what they did for the majority of their career, you know, despite where they may be or the fact that they're just sort of fringed, like for a lot of like lots of people know who George Romero is, but if I walk up to my mom and go, hey, Frank Hennenlauter's got a new movie coming out, she'll go, <laughs> who, who's Frank Hennenlauter? And, and then I'd have to explain and it would take me multiple minutes to just sort of like contextualize who he is and why he's important in the history of film, at least to me and to a big group of people who love cult film. Um, but I, I almost prefer that legacy to some degree. It, but again, I can't think ahead of myself either and go, what's my legacy gonna be? I really just have to think about the work what's next mm. you know what what and i and i like i said i have a stack of scripts i'm trying to get off the ground i'd love to make any one of them but i can't close my mind to the possibility something else is out there that uh is just i'm not thinking about that's outside of my wheelhouse that's outside of my perception of what i want to do so i'm constantly reading stuff that comes to me uh there's people that bring me projects that I, you know I, i'll help in some way shape or form whether it's you know come on board in this, as an associate producer advise them on distribution whatever it is but in terms of the stuff i actually want to direct um like i in an ideal world i know the path i want to take and i know the projects i want to make they're they've been either written or they're being written. And uh, it, that's the ideal scenario. I get these things that have been floating around in my head and on the page out there to actually demonstrate what I really, really want to do and what I really want to make it. They're just, they're bigger resources than I've had access to um, until this point. But I, I, I do not, I do not want, um, like if I come out of the water bottle tour and all I've got to show for it is a lot of water bottles, I'm okay with that. Um, just to know that I was in the rooms and that, uh, that I'm on that sort of radar, that in the future, maybe five years down the road, I get somebody who actually walks up to me with a project that I really, really care about that is of the level that, you know, I'm okay with doing that path. Um, but I have, I know, I have clo I'm close friends with a couple of filmmakers, one of which just wrapped a movie with a certain big Hollywood producer. Uh, and I'm not going to get into any kind of details or anything like that. Um, but he's been doing the LA thing. Uh, he's rep by CAA now. He was rep by William Morris before that. He's done a lot of projects. And I, you know, his career is really building, 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 building. Um, I, I envy that kind of path because for the most part, most of the stuff he's, he's been able to do has been what he wanted to do. They were based on his scripts and his writing partner's scripts. And, you know, the, there's been a lot of creative control. Um, but it's taken him, like, I think of, I've made six feature films now. He's probably made 14 of them independently, right? And, and then he get, gets to the point where he's written movies that like, you know, uh, Anthony Hopkins are in and stuff like that. Then he got to that point. Um, but he lives in LA and he's able to go and do those meetings any time of the day that he, that he gets called in there. And it, for me to really get involved and get management there and really move on that path, I would literally have to move there. And I don't see myself moving to the United States anytime super soon mostly because it's falling apart right now. But even, even before that, I didn't, I didn't see myself transplanting yet. I, I felt very, I feel very at home in Toronto. I feel like I, I can still, I still gotta have a few more years of trying to make things in Canada before I make that jump. I just, I sit here in a moment like this and I go, I don't know what the path is gonna be, but I'm open to whatever it might be. I guess is the best way I, I can put it, is that I'm gonna to work towards a certain thing and if something else comes knocking, then uh, I will evaluate it when it comes and uh, take that path or not. But uh, um, here's a question actually from the q and I just noticed we have some questions. Um, would it be possible to get Cube made today in today's climate? 
Uh, that's hard to know. You know, it was almost impossible to get it made in, in 1997's climate when I did it. And it was only because I made it, and I can say that because I had the script for a while and had been sending it around as a first feature film I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe a very experienced filmmaker wouldn't have those issues, but as a first time filmmaker, I sent it around pretty much everywhere and couldn't get it made. And it was only because of the Canadian Film Center which was the very, you know, kind of threading a needle type situation that, that it happened. Um, and it may be a little bit against their better judgment to begin with. So, uh, yeah, I think that's a, a very interesting question. It's such a different world now. Like, first of all, Cube was shot on 35 millimeter film. So the cost of making Cube now would unquestionably be less um, than when I made it. They just wouldn't have like the same amount of material to, you know, the, the actual, for a small movie like that, the actual materials and, and number of people required to make it isn't um, as demanding. But at the same time, what I find frustrating for myself and, and I would think for younger filmmakers is there isn't anywhere to sell it. Or it's not, not there are places to sell it, but there aren't as many and they don't, they just can't monetize movies of that ilk the way they used to. Like I was very fortunate in the sort of coming of age in the you know late '90s to sort of be at the in the heyday of independent cinema when those kinds of movies could come out of Sundance, be sold for an absurd amount of money, and then be widely distributed theatrically. That almost doesn't exist anymore. So I think that experience, um, I'm sad to say, is was unique to the time period that I was making that film in. But um, so that's why I find it. I'm so curious. That was also like, I made with the CFC could... too, right? That was like the CFC. Oh, yeah. Bunch. So it was, they're still the around, are there. they not? Like they still put money in the movies, but not to that level. Yeah. And they, they still meet, make feature films. No, it could still happen. It could still happen. I just think it's a, it's interesting. I think, I think you would have a better chance of making Cube on your own than I did at that time. Mm -hmm. But I think, the chance of getting it seen and out distributed. And it wasn't that well distributed to begin with, but even at that level it would be very difficult. It would be harder now for sure. Um, but that's not to be discouraging about it. I just think it's an interesting, that's why the whole paradigm that we're in now is so clearly shifting. And I, and I'm, I'm, that's, and I love hearing what you're saying about it because I think you have such an informed perspective on it. Um, but I don't think anybody knows quite where it's going. Like, I really don't, listen, I, if I were a major blockbuster feature film director like Chris Nolan, I'd be a little nervous right now. Yeah. Because how am I gonna get my $200 million film made when I can't distribute it theatrically? Like that, that model relies on theatrical distribution and that's, for the time being, that's over. So it's a, even the, you know, the behemoths out there must be sort of feeling a little bit uncomfortable. It's a well, I'd, very strange I'd also, moment. I'd also imagine for someone like Christopher Nolan, uh, if I was to use a drug analogy, he's been making bigger and bigger and bigger and more bombastic films. And it's almost like he's chasing a dragon of a bigger and bigger and bigger movie. So if all that was stripped away and he had to go back and make another following, it's probably like the, akin to like some kind of a, I wouldn't even know, like a, his world collapsing or something. It's like he doesn't have access to everything, every tool he possibly wanted to. But honestly, I would love to see Christopher Nolan do another tiny movie. Just to see, Yeah, I would love, like that, just that comparison of beginning of the career, far later in the career, same amount of resources. I would love to see that. Like does somebody, once they get that that, that big loose touch with the really nitty gritty way of doing things or, or not? I Some people I might. I bet he does. Yeah. I bet he does, and I bet he'd be fantastic at it. And I think that that's where it kind of gets exciting. So for mm -hmm. the young filmmakers out there who are hearing me talk and are like, oh, Jesus Christ. Um, I, I'm in an odd way, I'm, I'm a little bit excited to see this, you know, major franchise behemoth blockbuster mega film paradigm end <laughs> because it's become because it's eaten everything else up. It's sucked out. It's not that I, I mean, I like those movies. I'm not even disparaging the films themselves, but it sucked all the air out of everything else. And the, the space that I always wanted to exist in, which was like the mid-budget range, yeah, our you know, or dead. even small mid-budget <laughs> range, completely vanished. Yeah. And, and, and I'm hoping 
my hope is that with these new you know, streaming platforms that I don't think it makes sense for them to make a lot of $200 million films. No. So my hope is that they're going to research, you know, um, uh, uh, resuscitate, that's the word I'm looking for, resuscitate, res resuscitate that mid-range budget feature film. And then that's, that's where we'll happily exist in the so, utopian uh, future. So there's another question. There's only two, luckily, uh, so far. But um, someone just finished a indie feature film, and they're looking what, for ways to dis distribute it, mainly regarding streaming. And that seems like I don't know if they're just telling us about their film or if they're asking, you know, what is the best way to get a get a platform now? And I guess I could just answer: show it to as many sales agents as you can, then ask everybody about those sales agents who's worked with them. Uh, do your due diligence to make sure you sign with somebody trustworthy uh, and put your trust in them to some degree. And if you don't want to go that route, route and your film isn't selling and nobody's showing real interest, you uh, you might have to look into aggregating and self-distributing, um, which can cost money or it can be free. Really, you need to sort of evaluate the film you've made for the kind of potential it has in the actual market. And that's very hard to figure out. Um, and then from that point, you need to decide if I go with a distributor and I, you, I look at the other titles they've got and it looks like I'm not going to make any money from uh, from that particular distributor, is it still worth it to put it out through that person just to get it into the market in a bigger way than you can do it yourself? Um, but this is a conversation that would go on for ages because I don't know anything about the movie this person's asking about, so I can't be specific. But that's a very, but that's it. Yeah. Th I have to second that yeah. motion. Like that is a very intelligent approach. And, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and those are the proper order of steps to take. You need a sales agent, ideally, to sell the movie. You yeah. really do. Um, and especially right now in this sort of weird new world of like festivals that kind of exist but don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but let me, let me give you an example of, I'm, I, um, of a, 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 a hopefully a, a very um, uplifting story. I'm an executive producer on a film that's in Fantasia called- It's fucking awesome. Come True. Yeah, it's great. Which is uh, Anthony Scott Burns' movie, um, which is, th thank you for saying that. It, uh, I, I think Anthony's just brilliant and did such a great job. Oh, and he totally like, had the amount of time he needed to tell the story the right way. Like he, he told me his shoot days, like how many shoot days he got. And I was like, how? That's three, almost three times the shoot days I had for Life Changer. How did you pull that off? Like for the yeah, because he has a crew. I'm not going to talk he does it. But, yeah. Because he, well, he's a good example. Like I'm, I, I so admire his process. Like, he, I, mean, I wish I had the talent and ability to do what he does, but he, he can get 60 days because it's a crew of five people and he does everything. So, um, you know, not everything. He does a lot. He has like, you know, his right hand man, Nick, who uh, produces with him and then, um, you know, one or two other people who are right there, but that's how it gets done. And he's just so good at it that it looks like his movie cost 20 times what it did. Um, but, but what I was going to say about his film is that I think, this is just my supposition, I think that the COVID situation has made a more favorable environment for his film's release. Mm -hmm. Because, or I mean, when I say release, it's premiere. Like at Fantasia was the right festival for it. And there's more attention being given to this festival than it might normally have just because there's less noise out there. And there's also less movies that are finished being shown around to buyers right now. Mm -hmm. And I think in, in his particular case, the sort of his movie has a sense of isolation about it um, that people, this is just, again, me guessing, but that people are keying into because that's what they're you know, experiencing in their daily lives. Mm -hmm. so, um, uh, so maybe, you know, again, it's this weird shifting ground that we're standing on where on one hand, it seems like uh, maybe it's, you know, it was better 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And, but actually it might end up being better in our near future. So it's, it's hard, it's hard to it's, assess. Uh, it's anybody's guess right now, right? Like I, I can't predict the next six months, let alone the next year in terms of where the things are going to go. Um, and I don't just mean in the film industry, I mean, on a societal level, I don't know what our next year is going to look like. It could get really ugly. It could get better. It, it, I just don't know. All I do know is that at least in my own life with my own work, I've been relatively fortunate that the fact that there's such a dire, a lack of new product in the market has led to opportunities for the film I just made that I may not have gotten otherwise. Like a really good example, mm -hmm. I can't get into specifics exactly, but Cloudboard Jungle premiered at the beginning of June across Canada through the Canadian Film Fest uh, through their Super Channel partnership. So it broadcast across Super Channel and part of that came with a license fee. 
with Super Channel. That was enough money to pretty much cover the entire budget of Clapboard Jungle. So mm. oh, great. that wouldn't have happened if this hadn't have fallen apart and I just played Canadian Film Fest and had my premiere at the Scotiabank, right? It, would have, it wouldn't have been happened that way at all. And that same yeah. opportunity has now arisen for a lot more Canadian filmmakers with Blood in the Snow who also partnered with Super Channel with the exact same deal. So selection in that festival means you get a broadcast sale that probably covers a big chunk of your budget if you're a low budget Canadian filmmaker. And that would not have happened if COVID hadn't have happened. So, but sorry, so, but just playing at that festival guaranteed a broadcast license or just well, it, it happened? Super Channel, more, or Super Channel also bought the film along with the festival broad. So basically uh, right. May next year, roughly May next year, it starts airing on Super Channel as a regular license, but you've got a window to be able to do festivals first. So yeah, totally. it came with a broadcast sale. So, but no, oh, I understand that with your film. Yeah. But but with it, sorry, everyone, what, what I heard was was every every movie at that every festival. feature film playing the festival was offered the same broadcast sale. Every feature film. At every the feature film. Yep. So that has to be a record. That's crazy. Probably yeah. But this is a very uniquely Canadian thing. It's a very like it's just Super Channel saw the mar hole in the market and they took yeah. advantage of it and <laughs> it and it it's, it was out of necessity but it makes total sense for for the moment we're in and uh, it it gave the platform to uh, a couple dozen Canadian filmmakers that they may not have gotten otherwise financially. So like that is a big help. It just is, you know. I, I just saw Avi, Avi texted saying not everyone got the same deal. That makes oh. me think maybe it's time to introduce our friends. Well, okay, yes, let's introduce them. You're right, not everyone got the same deal because some of them already were Super Channel films. So they had already signed a previous agreement. Anyway, okay, let's bring in the rest of the team on Clapboard Jungle. Well, not the rest of the team. Uh, first, before we bring them in, I want to say there are people who aren't here. Uh, our associate producers, uh, Lee, um, Lee Bomi, and uh, Brooklyn Bomi, Ali Chappelle, and Chris Alexander are not on the call, um, but they were a big help in getting this film done. Um, and Sean Motley, our composer, uh, is not here. But we do have Avi Fettergreen, who's our executive producer and uh, distributing it in Canada, who will come on board at some point once they unmute him. <laughs> and then there he is. Uh, there he is. Uh, and then Kevin Burke, our uh, editor, he edited the film with me, uh, and he is an associate producer. And there he is. And Daryl Shaw, the co-producer on the film, who's been with me since 2014 on this project. Um, we're bringing them all into the call. I don't see Abby anywhere. Maybe I'm just not. There he is. Okay. So um, why don't we start with uh, each one of you guys, and we'll start with Daryl. Uh, just talk about your experience in making this film, and uh, you know what you got out of it, and what you want you what you brought to the table in terms of um, making it into the movie. It is. So Daryl, we'll start with you. Oh man, okay, can you hear me? First off, yeah. hello, check, check. Yeah, yeah you can hear me? Good, man. Okay, um, well, well, I gotta say again, Justin, more power to you. Like, I have just sort of caught the wave with you there, buddy. Um, I, I just felt like I, I, I tried to just be the, the devil on your shoulder or devil's advocate type thing and just contribute other perspectives. And I guess my main goal was just trying to keep it so that, um, your story is still in there because I know it, it interviewed a lot of big hitters and it, it was very easy to, to get caught up in, in those. But I found your story to be what I could relate to the most naturally. So I really, I mean, yeah, not, not much more than that, dude. I mean, it was all there. I just. Did your son draw the alien behind you? It's seen better days. It's, it's been rained on a bunch. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting place to choose to sit. Okay, uh, let's move on to Kevin Burke. Hey, so uh, yeah, I guess first and foremost, I want to say I'm really proud uh, to be a part of this project and working with Justin on it was absolutely fantastic. Uh, one thing that really drew me to it was in one of our first conversations where Justin flat out said, you know, I, I know that this is a film that's going to feature me a lot and I don't want any, you know, self aggrandizing bullshit. I want someone who will keep it in check uh, and not shy away from, you know, some of the more vulnerable moments uh, that a filmmaker goes through on this journey. And I, I found the fact that Justin was going into this film with that attitude to be extremely refreshing. Uh, and it, 
made it something that I immediately wanted to be a part of. Uh, and as I was going through the footage in the edit with uh, Justin and, and Daryl and uh, kind of piecing things together, it, it really resonated with me uh, a lot as someone who's, you know, been around to festivals and, and uh, met and interacted with a lot of people and, and young independent filmmakers to see this journey kind of materialize in a way that's very honest and, and you know, just not shying away from providing all the real world details of what it's like to, to go through the world as an independent filmmaker and, and try and make it. So, uh, yeah, thanks for letting me be a part of it, man. And you had a similar experience yourself with uh, 24 by 36, uh, just getting that made and out to the world. Can you talk a little bit about um, what you did then compared to what you would do now, now that you've sort of been through the process of, you know, helping to make this? Yeah, so um, I, I mean, with 24 by 36, it was the, it was the first documentary that I had uh, directed and, and produced on my own. And I, I also went on to edit it. Uh, and I'll say that Justin's film was a hell of a lot more organized when I got the drives <laughs> to work on it than my own was. Uh, I, I would caution anybody out there who wants to go on to work in documentary, make a documentary film, to be as organized as possible uh, because you are going to end up with hours and hours and hours of footage to comb through. Uh, and just because, you know, you have some dailies with a really great moment in it, uh, when you're, when you're out there shooting for years at a time and you have to go and find that moment again, it's going to be a huge nightmare for you if you don't keep things organized. How Thank many you. hours would you say we had to work with? Ah. Oh man. Uh, that's tough to say. There, there was what, 60 interviews? No, there's year? 120. 120 interviews. <laughs> and at the minimum... Was in the, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but like the span of the film yeah. is what, about eight years? Five. Roughly five years. Oh, five? Yeah. There's oh, about okay. 300 hours of raw footage. It was... It yeah, was, I thought it yeah. was 300. About 300. But the, keep in mind also, there's also, we're doing the, the eight episode educational series as well. So the, the movie is just one small part of the project. And then there's another 30 to eight, 30 to 40 minute episodes and then extended content. So um, we're using all parts of the deer, if that makes sense. <laughs> That's a good analogy. Yeah. Not necessarily all parts. You, do, you don't want to give your eggshells with your eggs as uh, Christopher McQuarrie put it, but all the good stuff's going to make it out there in one way, shape or another. Yeah, there's a lot of good uh, footage yet to come from this project, um, for sure. Let's go to Avi. Uh, Avi, why did you get involved with this? Uh, you also produced Life Changer with me as well. Um, so maybe talk a little bit about the process of just how you started working with me and what sort of led to this moment. Somebody had to do it, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so, uh, the of, or the, I, I, the I, I met place. Justin at an Anchor Bay um, function during, um, what's that Fan convention? Fan Expo, Fan yeah. Expo yeah. years ago. And he was sitting at the bar looking very lonely and I <laughs> walked up to him and said, you know, introduce myself. We got to chatting and um, we just hit it off. Like I, I really... Uh, didn't know anything about any of the work that he had done. I wasn't a big fan of genre at the time. Um, but everything that, that Justin and I were talking about, we, so we sort of, we found common ground on pretty much everything. And he put, he works extremely hard in all the different things that he does, both as a post production guy and as a filmmaker and everything. And I'm, I, I, that sort of same worth I, at, we're, like we're having conversations at one o'clock in the morning while he's doing his work and I'm doing I'm, my work down in my office um, about everything. And um, we just hit it off and we, we decided that we wanted to make, try to make some content together. So we, we started pitching some of the stuff that he, he started sending me stuff. I read it. I thought it was all very interesting and a whole new world for me because I had done, you know, I've done many, all, most of my most successful films have been drama that has premiered at TIFF and things like that. And I'd never done a genre movie before. So we had tried a, f a bunch of projects and we would get close on, a f on, on pretty much each one that we pitched. And then, you know, we get a, an investor ready to go. And then next thing you know, crickets and they would disappear off the face of the earth. 
and which if that's you, you know, watch so Clapboard Jungle, that's kind of what happened with, with Light Changer until I came, I called him one day and I had this brilliant idea about how to go and find the, the, that major money that we needed and, and, you know, we did it and, and we were able to make Life Changer and next thing you know, the film was playing all over the world and, you know, collecting air, air, air miles uh, would seem to be for like six, eight months. Um, you know, going to festivals together, um, uh, sh you know, sharing hotel rooms and, and trying not to together. keep each other awake with snoring. And, 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 and I was discovering a, the genre that I never really had discovered before. And so back in 2014, Justin said, I have this really great idea for this doc. And uh, I thought it was a great idea. I mean, I've been developing, a, been writing a book about indie, indie filmmaking for about five years now and um, 21 chapters in and I haven't finished yet because there's too many other things going on. But I, I said, look, as long as you don't make this all about you, but you make it about the process so people can, can get something out of it that they can relate to as well, then I think you've got something really solid. And, you know, as we were going to markets and festivals, he would bring his DSLR and a tripod and you, he would schlep all this stuff and figure out how he was going to pack it when we were going on these world adventures together. And he would literally get everybody who was anybody to talk to him and get, and he, you know, he's a great interviewer. He, he knows how to get the best out of people. Um, and he would show me little clips here and there and I was blown away. I would actually stand in the background during some of them and watch him. And, you know, once in a while he would go walk down this aisle at Cannes and I'm going to film you do that. And okay, well, so <laughs> you know, already I, became, I became a subject in his, I was sort of his B, I was his B roll. Um, <laughs> uh, you're, you're making it sense. sound like I directed you to do that. You were already doing that. <laughs> no, I, I know, was just but, following you. <laughs> but um, so, you know, and, and, you know, we've been developing all these other things and we were really, we were this close to doing our next film and then COVID happened. Well, like we were 10% of our budget away from being- No, we had that 10%. We just well, needed the, the actors. To but sign on. I mean, that's yeah. where we were at. And now we may be at ground zero again. Yeah, we'll, um, we'll see. We'll um, see. I don't know. We have another Q&A question uh, from the audience. Um, and this is actually a really good one that all of us can probably answer because we've all done a first feature and Abby's done 60 of them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they're not first, but- um, I have first features as calling cards lost their market cachet and is there something else you should be focusing on marketing wise to get yourself your career going beyond your first feature and uh we'll we'll turn it over to the let's go Vin, vincenzo you haven't said anything in a little while do you have any anything to say to this <laughs> i do <laughs> i think listen um okay i'm gonna try to make this really short but but my present day philosophy which i apply to myself as well as somebody who's never made a film is the most important thing as a creative person is creating something. Like the, 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 as I said earlier, the hardest part of this business is the time in between creating things. And, and for, except for maybe being an architect, there's no other job where you spend as much time trying to convince people to do something rather than actually doing it. And so whether you're just beginning or whether you're you know, 20 odd years into your career like I am, um, I think it's kind of the same situation. And, and so what I think, and I'm sorry, I'm coming around to the calling card part of this in a weird way, but what I think is great about this moment is that with this little iPad, which is what I'm talking to you on right now, I can make a graphic novel, which is something that I just did. Mm -hmm. I can make music, which I have no musical ability. I started recording music. The, you could make a podcast. There's so many things that are available. There's so many ways for you to express yourself that weirdly tie directly into getting a movie made. Like movies are being made based on podcasts. Movies are made up based on comic books. In fact, I would be very curious if someone did a survey to see whether more movies are being made based on um, other media, other IP than, than screenplays. Then, th sorry, made on other media than are made based on screenplays. Like, if it, I, I'd almost say like getting an original movie based on an original screenplay made is harder than getting a movie made based on a successful podcast. It's just well, the, mean, the, the so and it'd be interesting to hear what you have to say about that, Avi. But I think like basically this is a message of empowerment. I think that 
or you could make a film on your iPhone. You could just make a movie, but but the main thing is to make something and to create um, a situation for yourself where you feel like you can express yourself in the best, most exciting possible way. And, and, and that is the most direct way to getting a feature film made or getting a calling card made. Sorry. Well, I mean, I you know, I tell people that, you know, because part of this, I do a seminar about how to produce indie films. And one of the things that I say is like, where do you find your ideas from? And you know, just traditionally reading screenplays is not the answer. Like you could find it in a newspaper article. You could find it in a novel. You could find it, as you said, in a graphic novel or a comic book. You could find it um, on, on the news. You could find it in a podcast, whatever. I mean, the, the one thing about source material or IP is that you have a built-in audience with that content. You have a built-in audience with your graphic novel, your comic book, a book, whatever. I mean, I spend more time you know, I probably read over a hundred scripts a year of which maybe two I say yes to. Um, but I'm also reading lots of books. And now I've started reading graphic novels, which, you know, there are companies that represent graphic novels to sell the film rights to. Um, there's one based in Detroit, Michigan, that they have, I don't know, 50 to 100 titles of graphic novels that are made already, that they are representing those, those creators for film rights and TV rights. Um, but, you know, I think finding content that exists that already has a built-in audience is the way to go. One thing I wanted to ask you, Vincenzo, because I remember a story that was told to me about how you went and took Cube to Sundance and played it on a, on a small TV outside of a theater. Is that true? Uh, we projected it on a sheet in the <laughs> middle of the street. Yeah, in the middle of the street, right? And, and yeah. you were standing outside on a like an AV cart with the TV <laughs> playing Cube, right? That's yeah, it was a projected brilliant. image, but yes. Yeah. yeah, it's brilliant. Like, that's but, great. Which, believe me, is completely against my nature. It wasn't even my idea. Like, I'm not, I don't like to draw attention to myself or grandstand or, you know, do anything that's going, I'm too Canadian, you know, that would bother people who are walking in the street. But um, it was actually our distributor who kind of put us up to it and encouraged us to do it. I do think, and it did draw, <laughs> it worked. Like it, it did draw people's attention. There's no question about it. Um, yeah. I, I think, yeah, I could probably add into that and tie back into this, uh, this Q&A question a little bit too. Uh, just, we're in a time now where to be a filmmaker and to get noticed and to really put yourself on the map, you have to stand out from a massive pack of people. Like you have to somehow cut through the noise of 10,000 other people trying to do this. And a part of that isn't just the work. As much as I hate to say it, the work does matter. The, the movies you make matter, all of that matters. But what also matters in getting yourself noticed is a social media presence, uh, the ability to break outside of that and to be a real personality. Not everybody has to do this. Like everybody's going to have a different path to getting where they need to be. But I think part of how I'm able to build my career is just embrace. I, I suck at social media to some degree, but I still embraced it enough that I, I'm pretty active on, uh, you know, Instagram and Twitter. Uh, Vincenzo, you're really active, really active on Twitter now. Um, and, uh, and, you know, Facebook and stuff like that. And I interact with people and I'm constantly talking with people and my own personality becomes part of the story of the films that I make to some degree. And that's not really a calculated thing, but I think it is a necessary thing to some degree where you kind of have to be part of the part of the, your work to some degree uh, as well. I keep saying that same phrase, but um, you have to, like people that like Life Changer and want to learn more about me and the stuff I do or like this film and want to learn more about and the stuff I do, I, I kind of live in public to some degree, at least with my tastes in film and my opinions on things and stuff like that. And some of that might bite you in the ass if you're not careful. To, but it's not just about the work anymore. It's also about you being a commodifiable uh brand i guess is the way to put it i hate using that terminology i hate like compartmentalizing a filmmaker and who they are into a brand but it's true there's truth behind it you like the same reason i grew up loving john carpenter and i have shel a shelf of john carpenter movies and i have a shelf of you know you know uh fuck uh, the list is forever you know my frank hannemlauter section my don coscarelli section all that sort of thing you know who the, they are by name and you know who they are by name not just because they made movies you love but because you 
you like their brand of filmmaking and you like the way they are at conventions and you like like if you're truly a fan of like that genre that niche you're following the person as much as you're following the films to some degree so you kind of have to make yourself visible um as a human being to some degree to, i'm going to stop saying that one <laughs> saying that thing again and again and again but you have to make yourself uh, a viable human being that people want to actually get to know because your work is an extension of you and uh especially now like you don't want to be an influencer necessarily as a filmmaker that's a whole other other conversation but you do need to <laughs> you do need to uh package yourself in a way that's tenable for an audience. And that sounds super cynical and it's not meant to be. It's more just, don't put on a mask and put yourself out there in a way that it makes, it, you make yourself look like something you're not, but you kinda still have to play a game of a cult of personality in some way because people do notice when everyone else notices too. I don't know how else to phrase that. <laughs> Yeah. I, I, oh, it's so weird. I know. I know it is. <laughs> Daryl, Daryl, you must have something to say about this. I feel like you're one of the most plugged in people I know. <laughs> no, I, I oh, hate social you, media, you man. Oh, thank you. But, but, but yeah. you must have an opinion about it. Oh, I feel, I don't know. Like, I feel like social media is like a ball and chain. Like, I hate having to be answerable to anyone or mm -hmm. explain things or, or make sure I'm not like misinterpreted or, you know, so I, I really stay off it. I mean, just, I, I like, I use it to promote and stuff, obviously, but just as my, my own personal life or my own personal experiences, I don't really feel like I want to be a, a product to that degree. Oh, <laughs> oh, you're, I, I, um, oh, you are a product. Sorry, that was, that was, that was Justin's catchphrase. Trust um, me. No, I, I no, didn't really mean it to that extent, though. Yeah, no, no, I mean, no, I, I'm not trying to, I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't think it's wrong. I think, I think you're absolutely right. I'm just saying I, I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think, I, I, I wish it was just the work, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we work, we all work really hard on our stuff, right? Like that, that you'd think that would be enough, but because there's a lens on all of us now through social media that we're, you know, it, it just becomes a part of the equation, right? And then, um, you know, I, I have a lot of like a, a guilty pleasures and, and, and stuff like that. And like a, a lot of, uh, I, I, like, I like filmmakers and, and artists that have done questionable or, or, or terrible things, not Wait, what? <laughs> no, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying like, like I, I I, I mean, it's just like, uh, it, it's just, we're in, we're in a time now where, where people, froze. oh, can you hear me now? I, I can still see him. I can still see Okay. Him. I was going to say, we're just, we're in a, a time now where we're just your associations or, or, or your likes and like, you know, Justin brought up, I don't, I won't name names, but Justin brought up a filmmaker that I'm a fan of that did something sketchy at a party that isn't in, it's not it's not in wide circulation, but it's enough to upset me. And it's just it's it's weird that you you, you can't any longer be be a fan of someone in the work someone's work without them being a part of it. Do you know what I mean? Oh like, yeah, no, I get that. So it's like, oh man, I you know I love I found this this filmmaker Woody Allen. He's great. Oh, but did you know? Do you know what I mean? So it's it's tricky, right? To to separate work from art and, and self from art. Well, I, I, I do see what you're saying there, Daryl, at least in terms yeah. of like you, I actually, I, have, I had a friend uh, over a decade ago now, I haven't talked to him in a long time, but uh, he would never go see uh, musicians live ever. He only wanted to hear it on the CD because he felt like the, what, the moment he went out there and actually watched the live performance just kills the mystique of whatever he made up in his mind about who these artists were. You know, it's yeah. like... Um, and I get that. And there's definitely something to be said for um, just the work speaking for itself. But I think you kind of went down a road of, uh, of problematic filmmakers and or problematic yeah. people in general. And that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> Let's talk about it. In, no, in I'm, not, I'm, not, condoning any, I'm yeah. not condoning any behavior. I'm just saying that now that we're intrinsically tied to, to social media and our personalities, yeah. that it's like... <laughs> You have to be like a, a saint, right? Issues. Yeah, there's a, it brings up a, a whole bunch of issues. But 
I'm interested hearing from you younger fellows about use it, being empowered by it. Like mm -hmm. I, what is exciting to me, I do use Twitter and what's exciting to me about it is uh, not so much like promoting myself because not that many people know or care about who I am, but more, I like doing a drawing and putting it on Twitter. And it's like, it's instantly being shared with a bunch of people. It's like, it's in a gallery. It's like, yeah. like you know, I like being able to make something and then have the instant gratification of, of sharing it with people and, and getting a response. That is, that is, feels like a very empowering thing. And I would think, I'm curious, like from you guys, from your perspective, Justin, mm -hmm. or Kevin, if, if you'd like to speak to this as a younger filmmaker, um, do you have thoughts about how you might use social media or whatever it is um, as a tool? I, I do. I just, I do use social media as a tool. Uh, I use it, I've been using it for years to, to promote whatever I do or whatever I support uh, of friends stuff or films, because I'm a programmer too, right? I've been programming for Toronto After Dark since 2013. I run a short film festival. So I'm either propping up my own stuff through it or I'm propping up the work of countless other people uh, constantly through social media. I'm, I'm, I'm just always trying to put a, a spotlight on things, whether it's my own work or somebody else's work. So I really embrace that side of it. Um, I think... And I like it. I do like that. I think the danger comes that you can kind of get addicted to the gratification of what you mentioned there, the instant, uh, the instant evaluation, the instant likes, the instant. Um, there's definitely an addiction side of that where it's like you post something in the morning and it does really great traction with hundreds of likes and tons of comments. And then you're, you know, you're constantly checking it through the day and it's actually getting in the way of the work you need to do. Um, I, you know, there, that's a rabbit hole. You try, you got to try to avoid going down if you're actually actively trying to use social media to build a scene or build a, a following or put spotlight on other people. Because like one thing, and Mitch does this all the time too. Uh, and he's, you know, he, when he introduced this, um, he's always putting a spotlight on things through social. I think I have this need to kind of just whether I'm recommending a movie to someone or posting a, a song that I like or whatever it is to just share with the world an opinion on a thing. And it's always a positive opinion because I don't do negative opinions on uh, social. I just don't talk about it if I don't like something because what's the point? Why bring somebody else down? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But there is a level of challenge there and, and, and addiction where you, it's almost like the posting of the work trumps the work sometimes where you're like I can't wait to announce this thing that's coming sure. up in the Hollywood Reporter today oh I can't wait to you know there's this thing in the back of your mind going I can't wait to see what how the public reacts to that and I, I you try really hard to distance yourself from that in some way but I get that and that's yeah. obviously a danger but but is it exciting to you for instance when your album's finished yeah to have that outlet like 20 years sure. ago absolutely your album was finished in no one wanted to release it. Well, yeah. then nobody well, heard it. Well, now I can go to DistroKid and pay them $20 and it's on every single streaming platform like wow. within four weeks. And it's like, well, what? You know, and you keep 100% of your revenue. It may not be a lot of revenue, but who cares? Wow. But the idea is, is you literally, like I, you, I just put it out. It's just out, you know, and then you, you post it on your social and say, hey, check this out. And within minutes, you've got people coming back probably say, I haven't posted it yet, but it'll be like that. Yeah, there's absolutely... That is something that didn't exist before. That that a modern filmmaker or a modern artist has has that is really very positive. But the problem is, is that because everybody can do that, we come back to the conversation of oversaturation, where it's just like it's just a big it's just a big cacophony of everybody's releases all at once, fighting for control. And uh, it, it I, it's it's so easy to, for something to just get lost. And that's why you need the tastemakers. That's why you need the critics and the festival programmers and the people with platforms who retweet and talk about it and mm -hmm. all of those things. It's a, it's a whole cycle. Uh, Kevin, you got anything to say? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I use social media quite a lot as a marketing tool primarily. Uh, I use it a lot when we were making 24 by 36 and it, it was invaluable at that time. Uh, and I continue to use it. I mean, it's, I, I, I think, of course, I kind of agree with everything that's been said. I mean, there's always dangers of, of kind of, um, you know, you being able to easily pat yourself on the back because the people who already follow you 
are, are kind of in this little bubble and so forth, but I think that can also be very encouraging as well. Um, but I, I mean, also for other reasons, like I, I've built an entire career outside of independent film uh, just by using social media. Like I'm involved in, in the esports community now. I don't know how the hell what? that happened. Um, and like I voice the esports awards um, and, and I do a bunch of, you know, video work for them. And that all happened through social media and Twitter just from, you know, a couple of jobs that I had here and there, and it turned into something totally different. So th there's certainly a value in it uh, that allows me to, even in between making and working on large feature films, actually keep working in, uh, in the video and commercial space. Well, you're also one of the only one of us who's done like uh, attempts at sort of viral sort of content too, short comedic videos using like uh, the thing where you read, uh, you pro played a prisoner and out on work release kind of thing. And you're reading like Run No Jewels with oh, yeah. old people like that. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I did <laughs> a short series called um, Quarantine Community Service. Uh, and the idea was, you know, having to do community service hours in your house. Uh, government mandated because you're no longer allowed to go out in parks and, and you know, clean up the, the community because of COVID-19. And it was fun. Like it's, I, I mean, I, I love just shooting stupid little things like that and being able to throw them up online and, and share them with people. Plus it's, it, it's nice to uh, be able to continue to exercise those muscles of, you know, shooting and editing and, and working with sound uh, without, knowing that you know it's well it's got to take months or, or years until i can get this thing put together and all the money just to be able to put something small together and just throw it out there uh i i think just keeps um keeps you fresh and, mm -hmm. and working so that you're you're continually using the tools that you need to on larger projects well that's a whole other black sheep right is youtubers are filmmakers right like the people yeah. making all these youtube videos they are filmmakers and uh there are people that put out f you know five to ten videos a month who have hundreds of thousands of followers who get millions of hits and stuff like that and it's a whole other industry and community of people a different branch you can take uh with your filmmaking skills so it's it's the wild west now everything has changed and there is no one direct path to get you where you want to be anymore it, there just isn't and it's, it's going to be a different path for everybody and everybody starts in a different kind of level and uh and p some people certainly have more privilege and more opportunity than others and that's a sad thing that's hopefully going to be corrected in the future um and that's a whole other giant conversation but um, I would say that there are so many different ways to proverbially skin the cat now that uh, we're just kind of in a really exciting time where if you hold on to the past and how things were and not realize that that past is gone and dead uh, and don't embrace whatever the future has coming up, then you're going to be lost. And, and I think you really, need to, uh, you really need to just keep your ear to the ground and be open to outside the box ways of getting things done because things are going to keep changing constantly just non-stop they always do that seemed like a great closing statement it did seem like, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> are we closing is that what's going on i don't know we're I just getting started that, that seemed like a beautiful place to end yeah today. probably a good place yeah. <laughs> hey mitch are you waiting in the wings i think nope. it's gone. okay <laughs> i guess we just let it flounder outwards and just get awkward over time uh are there any more uh, q a questions from q a folks Oh, there it is. Oh, yeah, here we go. All good. Okay, here, here's a, one more question. Is it true Vincenzo took out a newspaper ad talking about being left out of the revenue profit share for Cube after its success since it was funded by the... Oh, geez, that's not a great question for the public. <laughs> I read that without... I'm sorry. Screen. Sorry, what? Are you guys... My, my screens are freezing. Are, oh, does no, that I'm, happen to anybody else? No, I'm good. Okay, that's, that's okay. good. Did you hear that? Do you, you want to... Did you take no, a I didn't. I didn't hear anything. I mean, it's oh, fine. Like, the question is: Is it true you took out a newspaper ad talking about being left out of the profit share for Cube? I feel like that's the weirdest question to ask publicly. No, <laughs> no it's no. not true. I would never do anything like <laughs> that's that. That's so weird. <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah, that's a weird question. <laughs> but uh, okay then. I guess we're. Uh, I guess we're done. <laughs> Maybe they'll. All right. That one. Okay. Well, that was fun. Uh, thanks, everybody. That was fun.
Thanks yeah, everybody for tuning in for sure. And uh, I, I guess we just, okay, all good. We're done. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Mitch, Mitch gave us a thumbs up, so I guess we're okay. Yeah. All right. Nice to see everybody. All right, everybody. Yeah, yeah, nice take to, care, guys. Uh, it's talk. Good talking. Yeah. Vincenzo, right. nice to meet you. Thanks, so much. Thanks for doing Such this, a everyone. Pleasure, Kevin. Thank yeah, you. good to see you, Daryl. Great to meet you, Avi. Same. See you later, everyone. Yeah. Take Bye, care, guys. Justin. Be well.